This is Daniel Minizini, your inquisitive geologist from Mini Geology Radio Show, KPFT HD2 channel in Houston, Texas. Uh, welcome everybody, all of you geoscientists uh, listening to this program that puts in touch uh, our beloved geology with other societal problems. Uh, you can reach us at minigeology at gmail.com or you can listen to the interviews at minigeology the YouTube channel, so minigeology.com. Today we have uh, Dr. Chris Duffin. He is on the other side of the pond and uh, he is waiting for us to talk from the Natural Museum of London and he is a scientific associate. Uh, Dr. Chris Duffin, welcome with us. Thank you very much, it's good to be with you. So Chris, we are going to talk today about a very interesting and peculiar topic, which is the relationship between geology and medicine. What can you tell us about that? Well, this is a topic that uh, extends back for thousands and thousands of years because uh, geological materials were used in all sorts of medicinal contexts right the way from Babylonian times through the period of the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans, right the way through Western uh, historical applications, uh, even until the present day, because um, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, modern medical geology is a topic of uh, very topical interest and uh, looks at the relationship between geological materials and health. And of course, it has had a lot to do with the development uh, of public health uh, in the past. Uh, very, very interesting. So from the times of the early civilizations, uh, two professional areas, they held the monopoly of the formal education. And uh, you write it very well in one of your books, which is one of those, the church, and the other one, medicine. Uh, medicine, uh -huh. fundamental for the human health, uh, provided the, the, the birthplace for all other scientific disciplines, including geology. Absolutely. There were uh, many of the polymaths of uh, early times uh, were interested in all sorts of different aspects of the natural world, uh, medicine amongst them. In fact, many of them were practicing medical practitioners. And uh, amongst their interests um, as sort of natural spin-offs were um, botany and zoology and geology as well. Geology in particular because um, some geological ingredients became very important as therapeutic materials in their prescribing practices. Was it more about uh, the rocks and minerals in the uh, geological material or was it more about plants uh, and more uh, uh, botanic and biological materials? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because um, you would get the impression from the publications that have uh, come out in the last uh, few decades that plants were by far and away the most important medicinal ingredients. And to some extent, that's true. Um, there has been recently a resurgence of interest in the use of animal materials as medical therapeutic materials, but virtually no work had been done on geological materials in spite of the fact uh, that they have such an extensive history of use. So really that's where I come in, I suppose, because uh, uh, it's an area that has interested me and um, uh, I've been trying to develop it. And uh, I would say that actually the number of geological applic uh, rather the number of medicinal applications to geological materials uh, is surprisingly large. I see. So, in fact, I, I, I'm curious about this. So, you say that it's kind of biased by the previous studies, the predominance of plants versus geological material in relationship with medicine. But I'm curious in understanding how did you come up with this idea of studying the relationship between medicine and geology? <laughs> Well, research is always a very interesting pathway and uh, uh, often when you begin to ask one question and uh, start to try and probe as to what the answers might be to that question, you find all sorts of other alleyways opening up before you. So my main research is as a paleontologist, vertebrate paleontologist, and I work mostly on sharks. And one of the things that uh, you have to do to correctly identify a shark's tooth or a shark's remain is to look at the original description. So I went back to the work of Louis Agassiz uh, in the 1830s 
and um, I began to read through the original descriptions of these various and teeth and so on that I was interested in. Uh, and I discovered a footnote, a throwaway remark, about something called glossopetri, tongue stones. And I thought, well, they sound interesting. I've not uh, read anything about those before. So I determined to find out a little bit more about them just for my own education. And I discovered that there was a whole series of pre-scientific names for fossils in particular, um, and a whole host of folklore beliefs, and amongst which were medicinal beliefs, about their uses. And very little had been written about it. They, these things had been mentioned in passing in uh, textbooks about history of geology and so on, but no real um, uh, work in depth had been done upon them. So I, it looked like a virgin research field, so I determined to start having a look at some of these things in more detail. So in, in a way you say that the fossils, they were thought to have some therapeutic um, uh, use. Yes. What, what was that? Did. What was that, the, the use that the uh, Bushmen, I don't know, what, who, which was the civilization that was using them? Uh, uh, well, for fossils, it mostly started with the Greeks and Romans in the first century AD. The elder Pliny, of course, who famously died in the eruption of Vesuvius, um, he wrote, uh, well, he wrote voluminous works, but the only surviving item that we have is his natural history. And in there, he records in a sort of an encyclopedic, rather eclectic fashion, uh, the prevailing folklore about all sorts of things, um, including numerous fossils. Um, so, for example, he is the first one that I've been able to find, at least, that mentions these glossopetri, or tongue stones, these shark's teeth, and uh, uh, some of the legends about them. But he also mentions uh, lots of other things as well, uh, something, for example, called lapis judaicus, the dew stone, which are actually fossil sea urchin spines, um, and the things that they were used for. So that was my sort of jumping off point. Um, Pliny the Elder, and also some of the Greek writers that uh, uh, were contemporaries of his, Galen of Pergamum, uh, in particular, Demigeron, and so on. Chris, I would like to go through uh, three main topics that you have de developed along your career, at least regarding this branch of studies. Uh, it would be methods, materials, and man connected to this uh, peculiar relationship between geology and medicine. Uh, let's start from methods, and uh, I would like to emphasize the intriguing connection between medicine and geology. So to investigate that kind of mindset of those individuals that moved from the medical needs to geological understanding, how does it work that uh, some people they, or some populations, they, they have some medical needs and they understand that they need to know better about the natural resources that they have around and the minerals and rocks and other geological material. Yeah, but, well, of course, there are lots of threads that uh, come together uh, and in different civilizations for these things. Um, now, I suppose you could say that there is a need there to begin with and uh, people look for some means of fulfilling that need. Um, so if we're thinking in terms of the therapeutic uses of materials, um, you have to really get back into the beliefs of the original populations. So for example, uh, if we were thinking in terms of the Babylonians, they had uh, an idea that diseases were caused by what they called the hand of ghost. These were basically ancestors that would um, uh, lay, ghostly ancestors that would lay their hand perhaps on part of the body and that would cause a disease or a pain in that sort of a body. And uh, therefore there needed to be some means of protecting against that hand of ghost in a prophylactic way in the first instance, or if you'd been touched, some way of mitigating uh, the effects of that touch. And uh, so the natural materials that were available to them, uh, they began to use and look at with uh, as if they had magical medicinal power. So things like hematite, for example, um, and uh, various pebbles, uh, different types of um, uh, quartz, uh, lapis lazuli in particular, these were all strung on beads and probably their shapes and their very deep colors and some of their um, rather strange uh, properties in certain instances uh, would be taken as evidence of magic, which would then uh, be used to uh, act against this hand of ghost. So that would be the Babylonians. 
if I come forward a bit now to the Greeks and the Romans, the uh, prevailing medical opinion there was that health was maintained by means of a balance of the humors. And the humors were fluids that were present uh, inside the body. And there were believed to be four of these humors, according to uh, the basic principles of Aristotle. Um, and they it were equivalent to the earth, water, fire, and air uh, system. And uh, they were called yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. And the idea was that if any one of these humors was out of balance, then it would result in a disease state uh, appearing in the body. And it looked as if that was true, because what would happen is that you would get eruptions on the body surface and they would exude uh, various fluids. In the occasional post-mortems that were done after somebody had died, you could see that there were strange uh, fluids that were present inside the body. So it looked as though there were these offending excesses of humor developing in the body. So the way to uh, act against it was to find some way of getting rid of the offending excess humor. So what they did was to uh, firstly uh, try and get rid of the humor directly at the skin surface by bleeding using leeches or cutting into the surface of the skin. Now nobody fancies that as a, uh, an intervention so it would be far better if you could have some sort of material that you could use in order to prevent that humoral imbalance in the first instance or to correct it uh, in a simple way uh, without the need for uh, chopping into an artery or something uh, before things got worse. And so they looked upon elements of the natural world, in particular minerals, uh, to try and do just this. Because there were some stones, you see, if we think about magnetite, for example, lodestone, uh, it's got magnetic properties. Not many other things do, and um, it, it's, it's an anomalous property as far as observation goes. Perhaps if you were to bring a lodestone, an uh, item of magnetite, uh, close to the body, it would withdraw the humor from the body. That was the sort of thinking that was uh, involved there. So they were attracted by touching these uh, colored minerals uh, more than uh, eating them. Uh, yes, well, a bit of both. Um, wearing the minerals as amulets so that they acted to prevent the imbalance of humors was a good approach. Or certain stones could be used to touch them. But uh, also there grew up at the hands of Galen, a very famous uh, physician of the first century, um, a whole system of identifying the sort of different strengths of materials in being able to get rid of these humors. And um, so uh, he and Dioscorides, uh, another Greek author, um, described lots of medicinal materials, herbal materials, zoological and geological materials, uh, in respect of their way of being able to do this, and included many geological materials in there, which they then um, ground up, usually into a powder, um, mixed it together, perhaps with other materials that might enhance their properties, it, put it into a paste or a water or some other material, a suitable draft to take, and so it could be taken internally as well. So both, actually, by touch, uh, by wearing it, and by taking internally as a sort of a proper medicine. I see. And uh, uh, these uh, conclusions of your work, uh, do they derive uh, from... Uh, which kind of method in study, how can you understand from dead bodies today how they were treated with the medicine at the time when they were alive? And yes. what was the relationship? How do you know that specific minerals they were used? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, luckily, uh, we have lots of written records survive from these times. Um, it really, the written re record of minerals in relation to medicine really begins with Pliny, Dioscorides, and Galen, these three people I've mentioned. Um, but uh, what happened was that when the uh, Roman and Greek empires failed, uh, the, uh, there was a threat to uh, all this accumulated knowledge, and um, it was Christians migrating into Persia that took some of these uh, um, written records with them and um, they were lost to the West but preserved in the Arabic tradition um, so that during medieval times 
uh, the Arabic medical tradition translated many of these works into Arabic, uh, from Greek and Latin, Greek in particular though, and in a sense they were preserved there, so they, they were lost in their original form, uh, and some of Galen's work only survive in terms of Arabic translations. So they've been, and then when uh, uh, in the sort of, um, what about the 13 and 1400s, um, when uh, there was a program of cooperation between the Arabic East and the um, Christian West uh, with a sort of a, a, a translation program of each other's works. Uh, there was um, a rediscovery of this information. So there's, there's lots of information that we have passed down to us uh, about the way that they were thinking and uh, the items that were being used and what they were used for. Now, um, we're lucky that there are still some original medical collections uh, still in existence so that we can correlate some of the names that were used with actual specimens and uh, that can either be tested with uh, modern techniques um, or are clearly just through normal geological observation uh, belonging to certain sorts of minerals. In particular, there's a lot of, um, there's seven or eight collections of Materia Medica from the late 17th and early 18th century surviving in special cabinets in various universities and museums in the UK. I see. So uh, it's fascinating. So you studied through the old documentations and old translations of the 13th, 14th century, yeah, uh, the way to right. understand the relationship between medicine and geology. And uh, Chris, we are talking with uh, Dr. Chris Duffin, scientific associate of the Natural Museum of London. Chris, I'm wondering if you know some relationship with the geography because you were talking about the Babylons and then uh, Greeks and uh, and Romans uh, and they had uh, their uh, present uh, in specific geological areas and I bet that depending on where they were geographically they used this or that other uh, geological material yes um, surprisingly local geology at least in terms of obtaining therapeutic minerals was not so important as you would think. Um, uh, it was in certain instances, if we think about the Egyptians, for example, um, everybody's probably seen uh, the film Cleopatra um, with uh, uh, Burton and Taylor, and uh, we remember the beautiful eyeshadow that Elizabeth Taylor uh, wore. Well, that, that sort of eyeshadow was used at the time. Uh, sometimes it was green, sometimes it was black. And uh, in uh, various uh, archaeological finds of special pots containing this type of material, which has been analyzed, the green, the green eyeshadow material uh, is malachite based, and the black is galena and sometimes stibnite based. And uh, why was it applied? Well, probably, nobody really knows for certain, but it might well have been to do with uh, preventing parasites from living on the surface of the eyelids, perhaps protecting the eyelids from the uh, harmful UV rays of the sun, and so on. Now, those were local materials, uh, but also the Egyptians um, valued very highly lapis lazuli. And at the time, although lapis lazuli is now known from uh, various places, the only real source in ancient times was Badakhshan in, in Afghanistan, uh, a very remote, out-of-the-way place which required a long distance of travel uh, to get to anywhere. And uh, it was shipped off uh, sort of locally uh, to Babylonia, to um, uh, Egypt, but also came to the West at various times as well. And there was a huge investment required there, both in extracting the lapis lazuli, because it's in a very mountainous, uh, remote area, um, actually transporting it. And then uh, because of its probably its deep color, um, it was revered for uh, various things and um, uh, so it entered into the sort of arsenal of the apothecary in order to be able to protect against diseases. In fact, some very interesting diseases. It was used uh, for all sorts of things, uh, one of which was to make your hair curl, which uh, I rather liked. <laughs> Uh, uh, Chris, we are spanning like almost for a millennium in here from Babylonians, uh, Egyptians, Greek, Romans, and, and Arabs. Do you see until the Arabs uh, the same mindset uh, uh, of these different populations living in different places? Uh, 
uh, in relationship with uh, medicine in geology? Uh, yes, they did. They they took the um, Greek and Roman learning as part of their own, but then they uh, that was a stimulus really to embellish and uh, develop their own system of medicine. Uh, so, for example, um, instead of the humoral theory of um, disease, although that, that persisted to a small extent, uh, they preferred to look at what was called the miasma theory, that there were um, vapors and uh, bad airs uh, that might cause disease. And um, uh, in a sense, there's a certain amount of uh, sense uh, associated with that. Uh, in Naples, for example, um, after there were uh, outbreaks of uh, plague, they blamed it on miasmas uh, from uh, uh, local swamps uh, or exhalations from the ground, which could well have been carbon dioxide uh, outgassing, of course, from uh, the uh, uh, magma chamber of, uh, of Vesuvius. So you can see a, a sort of a... A tie in there so their, their idea of disease uh, was evolving and they also evolved in terms of uh, the way they put their medicines together rather than having mostly single components to treat a, an individual disease they tended to combine things rather more and one example that I particularly like that comes from that tradition is what's called the gem electuary this is supposedly invented by a chap called Mezui uh, who died in 1015 and uh, his recipe for this uh, gem electory is highly complicated with all sorts of things in there, uh, including the geological components, garnet and zircon, sapphire, silver, gold, emeralds, uh, there's coral, there's um, uh, sardonyx, a uh, type of uh, uh, red chalcedony. It was all ground up together, mixed with various other things, and rendered into a paste. And then it could be used to treat a variety of diseases. Now, the question arises then, well, was it actually used? And we've got evidence from the UK, actually, uh, that it was used to treat diseases. It probably uh, was used to treat, uh, well, in fact, we know definitely it was used to treat um, Edward IV, uh, who was called Edward, sorry, Edward I Longshanks in the 13th century. Uh, when he was very ill at the end of his life, he sent for um, his royal apothecary to uh, send him all the ingredients to make these things uh, into a, a, an electory or paste. Uh, all the materials were got together and sent up to where he was. And uh, in the end, he died before the paste was able to get there. So actually, the, uh, the apothecary's bill was left unpaid, uh, and so was the bill for the transport, which was uh, even higher. I see. And uh, Chris, we are talking about great empires. Uh, yeah. So, and um, we stop uh, talking uh, uh, in, in chronologically with, with the Arabs. Can you tell us something about some more Western empire like the British Empire? Uh, is there any relationship between medicine and geology when we move into more modern times? Uh, for instance, you that you are based in London, do you know anything about that? Um, yes, the, um, uh, in terms of the Western tradition, so if we, if we take um, the whole of Europe rather than just the UK, uh, with the advent of publishing in the 1450s, of course, um, it was um, much easier to communicate uh, information around the world. And so uh, we had a revival of many of the ancient texts because they could be published for the first time and made available. Uh, they could be translated into vernacular languages, uh, which made them more readily available to those who weren't schooled in Latin. So that there was a, a proliferation of information and uh, people began to use their experience to feed into this. So there was this publishing bonanza meant to say that there was a, um, a great sense of innovation uh, in uh, Renaissance, early modern times. Times. So that um, we get some very uh, interesting characters uh, pulling together uh, information from all sorts of strange sources and adding their own to it uh, in order to uh, talk about uh, uh, the way that medicinal materials could be used. If I could give you some examples, um, there's something called terra sigillata. Now, this is, what this is, is these are clays that um, were dug in various places. Uh, throughout Europe, well, and elsewhere, um, mostly smectite clays, so these were exploding clays that take water into the crystal lattice, uh, bentonites and things like that, and uh, they were dug from classical times, 
uh, to act as anti-venins, anti-poisons. So the idea was that if, um, because most kings and nobles were frightened of being dispatched by poisoning, if you could take something uh, to uh, act against the poison, that would be beneficial. So these, these clays were worked, uh, dug up and worked into special pills or troches and stamped or sealed, uh, hence the name sigillata at the end of it, uh, in order to authenticate it and then distribute it all over the place. And we've got examples of these Terra sigillata pills uh, uh, in most medicinal collections uh, throughout Northwest Europe. And uh, they were being dug uh, right the way through uh, to the 16th century. So they were being made available uh, almost continuously to uh, the uh, sort of Renaissance medicine. In one particular place on Malta uh, at Rabat, where um, St. Paul was shipwrecked on Malta uh, on his way to be tried uh, in Rome, and he famously spent a year or so on Malta, um, effectively um, enjoying the island's hospitality. And the people looked upon him as a saint at the time, and he lived in a cave beneath um, what is now uh, uh, St. Paul's Grotto um, in Rabat, in Malta. And uh, it's believed that he was essentially so holy that uh, uh, his holiness seeped into the rock. And so they began to chip out this sort of marley limestone and uh, work that into troches uh, because the uh, mineralogical material was sort of enhanced uh, by St. Paul's presence. And that went on right the way through to the 17th uh, century, uh, again, uh, distributed all over the place uh, in, in Northern Europe. And uh, we are talking, so now we are uh, into beyond the medieval times, so things, they they change, and they probably have changed with the very uh, first uh, understanding of geochemistry as a scientific discipline. So can you uh, tell us something about what it happens uh, once scientists they start working on the primitive part of what we call today geochemistry yes well i suppose we would put the roots of uh, geochemistry um back to a chap called uh, paracelsus um who flourished at the end of the 15th and the early 16th uh, century and he was a um an alchemist and um, uh, you could say he was both uh, a genius, a man ahead of his time, but uh, also had some very strange ideas as well. Um, so if we're thinking about the mindset and the background uh, to things, he, he was very strongly of the opinion that what was called the doctrine of signatures was what um, indicated to man the useful therapeutic materials that were in the world around him. Because what he said was, this was a resurrection of a fairly old idea, but uh, what he said was um, that God had planted in creation all of the things that man needed for his material benefit, including uh, medicines. And you only had to look at the nature around you and you would be able to spot, if you were a trained person, you would be able to spot those things that uh, could be used as medicines uh, by virtue of their different qualities. Might be their color, might be their shape, perhaps their smell, uh, all these sorts of things. And um, uh, so he chose uh, many medicines on that basis. And um, he, uh, he, didn't, he was a bit of an itinerant and didn't uh, write a great deal uh, for publication in his lifetime, but much was published uh, afterwards. Uh, but he uh, was famous for um, dumping the whole of the sort of canon of medicine that uh, universities relied upon in a very uh, strong-willed act. Uh, while he was a lecturer in Basel in Switzerland. On one particular day, he uh, went and took his copies of Galen and Avicenna and uh, other great medicinal uh, treatises and threw them in the bonfire um, and effectively said, well, uh, I know more than these people. Uh, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's no value uh, in them at all. In fact, uh, uh, he said, uh, this is a quote from him, I don't take any medicines from apothecaries, 
because their shops are foul sculleries. Let me tell you this, every little hair on my neck knows more than you and all your scribes, and my shoe buckles are more learned than your Galen and Avicenna, and my beard has more experience than your high colleges. So you can see somebody who's quite arrogant and uh, uh, has a high opinion of himself, um, but the innovation that he brought in uh, was that the um, materials that he was looking at, um, they didn't of themselves um, act as a remedy, but they contained an essence, what he called the quintessence, uh, which was a sort of a hidden material, a hidden therapeutic virtue, which needed to be released from inside the rock or the piece of animal or the herbal material. And he suggested then that the release of this therapeutic virtue should take place by various alchemical techniques, um, like distillation, well, particularly distillation, but other, other ones as well. So what he was doing was he was distilling the active ingredient uh, from various uh, 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 materials. So, for example, if, uh, if you were to take uh, stibnite and uh, treat it in a particular way, uh, then uh, you would uh, be able uh, to release the active component, uh, the antimony that uh, it's based on. Antimony had a, had a very... Uh, popular uh, use uh, as a medicinal material um, and um, likewise um, cinnabar cinnabar could be uh, the, the main sulfide ore of mercury uh, could be treated in such a way as to release its ingredient well now that of course is is liquid mercury uh, perhaps combined with sulfur to form um, uh, a sulfide uh, that was more pure and usable and then it could be used uh, for example to treat uh, children for worms and uh, treat gonorrhea and so on. So that what he was doing really was uh, getting away from having uh, large quantities of sort of raw lump material, releasing the essence so that he was purifying it and that, that meant great strides really so far as uh, being able to assay it, being able to uh, work out a suitable dosage, because if you know if you've got three different ores of uh, cinnabar, for example, um, and they could all come from different places and have different amounts of mercury in them. So how how are you going to be able to tell uh, what's an appropriate dose? Standardising dosage was going to be important, and of course, it, in the end, it led to the isolation of uh, different elements, so that uh, nickel and uh, copper and so on were able to be uh, isolated and identified uh, properly from some of these activities and these materials. Very interesting. The personal beliefs um, of such an important character uh, obviously are put in place with the associated uh, social uh, background. Uh, I would like to talk about the religion in relationship with medicine in geology, because you kind of mentioned that. And can you tell us something more about the role of religion? Because we have been talking about uh, many different civilizations, which they had very different religions. So yes, absolutely. What, yes, can you tell us about that? Um, yes, certainly. Um, as far as the West goes, the many of the uh, medical practitioners um, uh, at least in medieval times, came from ecclesiastical backgrounds. So if we were to look at the main uh, healers that there were in medieval times, probably the main person that you would come across is Hildegard of Bingen uh, from the early 11th century. And now she was famous for um, her music, her philosophy, lots of her writings, but she was also um, the author of two medical treatises um, which contained information about stones. And she claimed that the knowledge that she had of the way that different stones were to be used came directly by the Holy Spirit uh, from God. And she seemed to be anointed in so many other areas. Um, people didn't gainsay uh, her claim there. And so in her instance, you find that uh, there are elements of the sort of prevailing ideas, um, but uh, wrapped up with new information that uh, she supposedly got by revelation. So there was, there was, there was that sort of factor, the, uh, the fact that um, many of these people came from ecclesiastical backgrounds and perhaps worked out of monasteries uh, and so on. Um, and then there is a sort of a, an overprinting, if you like, of uh, religion upon some of these things. Because many of the ideas behind the uses of different mineral materials in particular um, came from a folklore base. And uh, it's as if they were taken 
uh, and ratified by the church and given this uh, ecclesiastical uh, authority. Uh, one of these, uh, the examples here is uh, actually unicorn horn. Now, unicorn horn is, um, um, everybody knows that uh, uh, the narwhal tusk is probably the main thing that was identified as uh, a unicorn horn, but uh, there are also records, particularly in Germany, of mammoth tusks being identified with unicorn horns. Um, now, without going into uh, all the differences there, the, um, uh, the uh, Cathedral of Saint-Denis in uh, Paris uh, had a unicorn horn that they kept inside the chapel um, and with one end in soaking in a bowl of water so that the poor could come and they could use the water that this magical unicorn horn um, was resting in. They could use that water to drink it, perhaps sprinkle over themselves uh, and gain therapeutic uh, benefit from it. So um, it was a, uh, originally the idea of the unicorn comes from uh, Indian culture um, and it's, it goes through folklore and it sort of pops up again uh, in Western religion, uh, uh, Western thought, uh, but then there's this sort of appreciation of it and um, almost sanctification of it, I suppose, uh, uh, in the church. Is that okay? Yes, I, uh, I, I see. Um, we have been talking uh, about the methods and the man with all of these civilizations. Uh, I would like to use this example of the unicorn to start talking about um, examples of other therapeutic use of geological materials. And when we talk about geological materials, we mean uh, minerals, rocks, earths, and fossils, as you just mentioned. So uh, I, I have some curiosities about in here, and I know that you studied them. Uh, it, more, in, more in general, which were the most used rocks uh, in the relationships between medicine and geology that you have been studying? Okay, they probably the most, the most commonly used would have been this terra sigillata that I mentioned before. Um, uh, but uh, also amber. Uh, amber is, has got a surprisingly diverse history um, and um, uh, diversity of use medicinally. And, and in a sense, it fits all of what we've been saying absolutely beautifully. Um, now, the amber that was available mostly uh, during these uh, historical times uh, came from the Baltic coast, the Sumland Peninsula, where it's still uh, mined today. And it was present in large quantities. It could be easily dispatched uh, throughout the Roman Empire, for example, and right the way through um, to uh, modern times. And amber, again, is one of these things that has anomalous properties. I mean, it's, it's got a variety of colors, for example. It's very light uh, for its volume, so its density is low. Um, it's got... Um, um, insects and so on appearing in it, which um, would look like magical uh, things to uh, people looking at it. Um, and also when you touch it, it feels warm to the touch, not like any other uh, rock that you were going to hold. Um, and also if you rub a cloth against it, it shows an electrostatic uh, attraction of smaller particles. In fact, um, an old word, sorry, an old word for amber was electron, and we get the word electricity uh, from that. Now, amber was used in every way imaginable as a medicinal material. So it was used as an amulet, for example, for protection. Pliny talks about uh, people in the region of the um, River Po uh, that, you, that wore necklaces of amber around their throat uh, to try and protect against goiter and uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, pharyngitis and uh, various other problems of the throat. And you could imagine that the color of the amber beads uh, would uh, hark back to the color of a person with a sore throat, perhaps the amber color would protect against uh, the sore throat. So it was used, it was used in an amulet in, in all sorts of ways. It was also used in powdered form. So like we were talking about with uh, Galen and others, uh, so that it would be ground up and added as a powder in milk or beer or wine or other things, uh, sometimes to other materials uh, and drunk. 
it could be um, worked into pills and lozenges and troches and things like that. Uh, you could just drink it straight down in a mixture once it's suspended in a, in, a, in a wine or something like that. You could burn it as a fumigant so that there were people that would um, put a cloth over their head and smell the fumes of the amber. And those fumes, uh, which were unlike any other fumes, uh, would be able to drive out uh, diseases. It could be used as a pessary, for example, to uh, uh, mitigate women's problems. And then when we come to the Paracelsian treatment of it, you could, dis you could treat it in alchemically in all sorts of ways so that that raw amber could be distilled to produce oil of amber, which then you could add to uh, various other uh, ingredients. You could rectify it, which means distill it a second time and then dissolve it in ethanol to give you tincture of amber. Again, that could be added to all sorts of other ingredients. Uh, or it could be sublimated, so uh, sublimated directly from a gas state to form salt of amber, which give you, would give you a convenient way of storing the essence of the material. And again, it was, it was used for s such a wide range of diseases, you could almost say it was a, a cure-all. It would be hard-pressed to find a disease that it hadn't been used uh, to treat in one way or another. What other uh, materials, like maybe the pumice? The pumice? But yeah, pumice is, a, is an interesting one because you wouldn't think pumice would have any application at all. Um, uh, but uh, actually, uh, it does. It, um, right from classical times, um, it was used uh, as a dentifrice, which means to say it was ground down uh, into a fine powder uh, and perhaps mixed with other fine powders, powders of pearl and coral and things like that, uh, and mixed into a paste with some sort of gum. Um, and then you could use it um, as, a, as a toothpaste in order to um, wipe the scale uh, off of the surface uh, of the tooth. Um, it was also used rather frighteningly in uh, eye diseases. So they would there were special sort of recipes for grinding it down into a, a powder. Uh, you had to wash it in wine and heat it and so on, all, which, uh, all of which uh, would tend to make it uh, reasonably sterile because, of course, pumice has got a, uh, an in enormous porosity and uh, all sorts of things could be hiding in, uh, on the walls of the vacuities. Um, and so uh, the powder that was produced uh, could then be used to treat eye diseases. Now, some of the treatments uh, were... Uh, fairly straightforward. They could be mixed with uh, uh, other ingredients into paste and taken uh, internally. Uh, but uh, one rather frightening one is it was uh, after the eye had been washed, especially if there were ulcers or something like that on the cornea, what they would do is they'd put a little pile of ground up pumice on the palm of the hand and then blow it into the person's eye so that you've got all these uh, fine uh, shards of uh, volcanic glass now in the eye. And it was supposed by virtue of its properties, to be able to dry up corneal ulcers and to help wound healing and so on. It's not something I think I would like to have done myself. <laughs> Chris, what about gold? <laughs> well, yes, again, gold is uh, one of these things that uh, uh, has got a surprising history. You wouldn't really believe that uh, uh, gold would uh, should have... Uh, such uh, sort of a pharmaceutical uh, application. Um, but uh, it was extremely popular as a medicine and uh, usually uh, rendered down into fine filings or thin leaves, standardized in size. And then um, during the Middle Ages and later times, it was um, incorporated into uh, a particularly famous medicine called uh, Aurea Alexandrina. And uh, this was very often accompanied with um, uh, components like silver, gems, pearls, and uh, lots of precious stones again. And uh, uh, as well, used to coat various medicinal things. Uh, uh, um, it was used to coat the goa stone, for example, and various pills, quite probably uh, in order to give a, a special sheen to the outside, because you could raise your prices uh, that way if you were going to sell a pill. It's a, you know, who's not going to buy the gold-plated one? Uh, uh, but also, because of the obnoxiousness of some of the ingredients in these pills, perhaps it cut down the smell um, of the material so it uh, made it more palatable. 
and then potable gold as well, which was drinkable gold. That was a, there was a sort of a big um, competition to find the best way to uh, suspend gold in uh, a drinkable fluid so that it could be taken into the system. And because it's got, again, uh, special properties, it doesn't tarnish its, uh, its malleability and so on, uh, you can understand why they were using it um, as, a, as a special pharmaceutical material. When we talk about gold, I think about the pre-Columbine civilizations in uh, Latin America. Any study uh, on the at parallel times what, with what was going on about geology and medicine in Latin America? Uh, well, um, I don't know of much work on pre-conquest uses of geological materials. Uh, there may be some there, but it's not something I know of. Uh, what's probably more important is that post-conquest, um, the various ideas from the folk medicine of Western Europe were transmitted across to South America in particular, and there they seem to take on a new life of their own. So, for example, there is one particular stone that was praised since Pliny's time uh, as the Etites, or Eagle Stone. And this stone we now know um, was a siderite nodule with um, clay particles inside so that when you shake it, you hear a rattle. In fact, in the States, they're called rattlestones. And it was believed uh, from Pliny's time to be important in being able to control childbirth. The idea was that you could tie it around the waist and by its magnetism, it would be able to hold the baby in the womb. Now, if the time came that the uh, lady was threatening to have uh, abortion, let's say, then that presence of the utility around the waist would hold the baby in. Alternatively, if she was having a difficult time in labor, then you could uh, whip the utilities down to the kneecaps and uh, the magnetism would draw the baby then down the birth canal. Uh, the idea was that the eagle had collected this stone from faraway shores, taken it back to its nest, and it was using it to be able to hatch the eggs. So that, that's the sort of Western uh, setup that was uh, in place. But then when we look at the way that um, that was transmitted over into South America, uh, there has been a study that has found the same sorts of names and properties ascribed to geological materials but not to siderite nodules, but actually a series of uh, spiriferid brachiopods instead. So it's a case of uh, translocating the uh, ideas, um, but then adding them onto a different geological component, one that they had available uh, locally. And uh, so talking about the um, genital or urogenital issues and uh, aphrodisiacs, can you tell us something about that? Sometimes we see museums like rocks with uh, phallic shapes uh, and, uh, and material regarding the, yes, the urogenital issues. Yes, that's right. These um, uh, urogenital problems uh, were rife and uh, one of the ones that was most feared was bladder stones or urinary stones generally, so that could include stones in the kidney uh, as well because they were uh, accompanied by great pain. And of course, uh, if you had one, a large one lodged in the neck of the ureter, um, it could lead to death. And so uh, if there was any way of being able to prevent bladder stones taking place or to treat them, uh, that would be brilliant because the treatment of sort of last resort was an operation known as a lithotomy and that was that was a horrible operation because the person had to sit uh, with his legs in the air and undergo uh, a, a cut for the perineum and then uh, have the stone taken out and because it would cut into the alimentary canal very often it would be attended by pituitary and um, uh, uh, septicemia and all sorts so generally it was a sort of a, there was about a 40 chance 40 percent chance of survival so any, any stone that could be used to um, prevent the, the, the bladder stone from developing, so much the better. And there was a whole host of them. St. Cuthbert's beads, which were fossil crinoid stems from the Carboniferous, uh, for example, were worn uh, against bladder stone and kidney stone. And there were 
several fossils that were used. Uh, so, for uh, example, um, um, Lapis judaicus, which I mentioned before, uh, Balanosiderus glandifera spines, which are sort of large bulbous spines that uh, attach to the outer test of the echinoid, have a roughly phallic shape, and they were used very, very commonly in order to uh, treat um, uh, bladder stone, supposedly breaking the stone up uh, in position if you were to uh, if you were to use it. Um, then also there was belemnites. Belemnites were um, a favourite uh, for that sort of use, um, and they are known in early modern collections um, uh, where they're given the name Lapis Lincurium, the link stone. And this harks back right the way back to Theophrastus, three centuries BC, uh, who first described the link stone. And um, he describes the lynx as an animal that uh, when it uh, passes urine, it hides the urine by digging it into the sand so that men would not be able to find it because if they did, they would exploit it for its uh, medicinal properties. He didn't say what the medicinal properties were. That was left to later authors. But the tradition grew up that uh, this lynx urine could be used for all sorts of things. Now, the lynx at the time was credited with all sorts of... Uh, uh, wonderful uh, abilities, um, one of which was to be able to s sort of have a, a system of X-ray vision so that it could see through solid rock. And uh, in fact, the, there is the Academy of the Linkside, one of the Academy de Lince, uh, uh in Italy, which uh, uh, had people like Galileo as members because they were, these were visionary scientists and they took the links uh, for their name. So if you managed to get hold of some lynx urine, then uh, you would be able to use it to treat various eye diseases um, and as well as uh, these bladder stones. When it comes to the belemnites in early modern times, um, it's clear that belemnites were associated with this lynx urine. And the idea was that the belemnite had a phallic shape again. And uh, some belemnites, particularly from Maastrichtian of, uh, uh, of the Netherlands and Belgium have a sort of a yellowish cast to them, which makes them look slightly like urine. And if you break them and sniff them, according to Robert Plott in uh, 1697, uh, it smells like cat's urine. Uh, it, presumably it's just the bitumens that are present uh, in the fossil. And uh, uh, so by those means, by the doctrine of signatures, these must be linked urine. And so they were used, uh, belemnites scraped in various ways uh, to be able to be applied to various medicines to protect against, uh, against bladder stones, as we've said. Um, and probably the uh, one last one uh, is uh, uh, nephrite jade. Uh, that was brought over from South America by Sir Walter Raleigh and um, uh, special uh, curved stones were produced, threaded on a string and tied around the waist adjacent to the kidneys so that they, in that position, would be able to uh, keep the kidneys free of disease. And in fact, Christian IV of Denmark uh, wore an amulet uh, all the way through his life to protect himself against bladder stones. And when he died, it was something, he died of something that wasn't bladder stones at all. So the argument would be, well, yes, the nephrite did its uh, job perfectly. <laughs> Chris, uh, so we talk about pumice used uh, to clean teeth, um, clays as antidotes to poison, gold uh, to cure uh, maybe hemorrhoids and gem pastes to treat syphilis. And, and we know there are many other uh, materials used uh, in relation with medicine. So how much of this uh, today uh, we know it was true? Uh, yes, um, there have not been many studies looking at this. Um, now, of course, there is um, uh, uh, New Age beliefs have incorporated uh, uh, the idea of gemstones as therapeutic materials uh, on the basis of the energy that they commit into uh, their philosophy. Um, uh, that's not uh, generally uh, followed by mainstream medicine. Um, and I suppose there are echoes of it um, in homeopathy, uh, where small amounts of material, um, the, the sort of therapeutic virtue that uh, Paracelsus talked of, uh, could be found in, in medicines. But otherwise, the uh, medicinal application of geological materials is much reduced, 
Um, but it's still there. I mean, there's um, barium sulfate varieties, for example, provides uh, barium for barium meals that uh, is an important component of uh, um, x-rays of the soft parts. Uh, both gold and copper, for example, are known to have antimicrobial properties, and so they're incorporated into uh, various drugs like that, sulfonamide drugs, uh, which are based on uh, initially on native sulfur, which was used as a, as a skin uh, treatment, uh, 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 known as good um, antimicrobials, and so on. So there, there are individual materials uh, that are still incorporated in medicines today. And uh, I think that we have a branch of study in medicine which is called medical geology. Uh, is it true? Yes, that's right. Absolutely. The, uh, medical geology is uh, well, really, a, uh, I was going to say up and coming, but it's been around for about 100 years, really. Um, and what it is, it's the study of the influence of uh, all sorts of geological factors um, on health. Um, and especially the geographical distribution of health problems, and that could apply to both man and to animals. And other sorts of factors that are involved might be the excess or deficiency of various trace elements that are needed in the diet to maintain health uh, because these materials, for example, are used as cofactors in enzyme um, uh, controlled reactions and so on, uh, but also radionuclides that might be around, mineral dusts that might come from um, uh, windblown, uh, deposits, uh, uh, also um, volcanic emissions. Uh, there's a whole range of possible ways that uh, geological deposits and geological activity um, could determine the distribution of populations initially, uh, but also of uh, problematic um, uh, situations as far as uh, health goes. And of course, uh, envir environmental geochemistry um, could be considered as a, a branch of that uh, because it uh, seeks to uh, uh, investigate uh, compositions of waters, for example, for, say, arsenic or whatever that uh, um, might need to be used to understand flow patterns so that you can actually put some sort of real science on uh, the distribution of a particular disease. Chris, you moved from being a paleontologist studying uh, shark teeth to this peculiar relationship between geology and medicine. What uh, have you liked the most uh, in this uh, new field that you are developing? Uh, well, but I get a buzz out of both, uh, doing both sets really. The, uh, there's, in, in both cases, you'd be perhaps surprised, there is the sort of lure of the chase. So if um, uh, actually finding, collecting new uh, faunas, uh, working them out and uh, identifying them, description new species, trying to work out how it applies to uh, a broader picture of life and so on, uh, on the one hand. Uh, but there is uh, still that uh, sense of the, the chase as far as trying to find obscure references to some of these geological materials, work out what they were used for, put them into the overall context of the thinking of the times. Um, are there any patterns involved there? Put it against the backdrop of uh, changing fashions in medicine and uh, changing philosophies and so on. So uh, there's more commonality between the two disciplines, perhaps, uh, than you might think. And they say that a change is as good as a rest, don't they? So uh, when I'm exhausted from shark teeth, I can uh, just zip over the border and uh, look at uh, geological materials as medicines as a sort of a therapy in itself. Chris, we are talking with Dr. Chris Duffin, Scientific Associate of the Natural Museum of London. Is there anything else you want to shout out to the public, to the audience? And um, and you have here a megaphone, a KPFT HD2 <laughs> channel with mini geology program, and uh, the air is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, I would firstly say that there are... Uh, only a few books where that you could consult to look any further at any of this. Um, one of them uh, is uh, entitled uh, A History of Geology and Medicine, uh, edited by myself, R.T.J. Moody and Gardner Thorpe, and that's published by the Geological Society as a special publication, 375, and it appeared in, in uh, 2013. And then there was a follow-up volume in the same series, special publication 452, Geology and Medicine Historical Connections, which appeared in 2017, and also a book on amber in the history of medicine um, from 2016, published by the Amber Museum 
in Kaliningrad. Uh, but if anybody's interested to follow up some of this information a little further, um, then if they look me up on ResearchGate or academia.edu, there's access to lots of my publications there. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris Duffin, Scientific Associate of the Natural Museum of London. This is Daniel Minizini, your inquisitive geologist uh, with the Mini Geology Radio Show, the only weekly program talking about our beloved geology in the relationships with the great society and societal issues and problems. So you can write me at the mini geology at gmail.com and you can follow the interviews at minigeology.com, which is a YouTube channel. Write me and let us know if you want to listen to somebody and some topic in specific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Absolute pleasure. Bye.